This is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And our theme for the day is deliverance from bondage, freedom from slavery. The Hebrew people had been taken captive into the nation of Babylon, modern day Iraq. And they were kept there for many years. But they prayed to God and longed to be delivered that they might return to their homeland. They called upon God to remember the promises he had made to their ancestor, Abraham. This is referred to as the rock from which they were hewn. They pray that God will be faithful to his covenant and will free his people. In our Old Testament lesson for this morning, the prophet Isaiah reassures the believers that God will keep his covenant. He will intervene in their present tragic circumstances because God has never deserted them. The prophet's purpose is to encourage the people who are faithfully trying to heed God's word and are looking ahead to God's promised deliverance. They're in exile right now, but God is going to take them home. From the writings of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 51, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him. But I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of a song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and my infant for my arm they hope. Lift your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. And those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever. And my deliverance will never be ended. Here it's our Old Testament lesson. In Psalm 138, the psalmist offers a prayer of thanksgiving for God's steadfast love in preserving him through troubled times and how such intervention fulfills divine purpose. Psalms of thanksgiving such as this one always ask us to look backwards to see what God has done for us in the past and forward to see what God will yet do with us. We look at the past and we see moments of faithfulness, God on full display, so that we might stare into the present with great hope and into the future with confidence. If ever there was a psalm that spoke to us in the midst of our pandemic and in the midst of civil unrest, it is this one, Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. 
For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And this is our song. In our New Testament lesson, we again continue hearing from Paul's letter to the churches and Christians in Rome. His theology and his preaching, his letter writing, all had one goal, to bring his audience to an understanding of faith in Christ in its Christian form, that they might commit themselves to a life of discipleship to Jesus. He proclaimed primarily, if not exclusively, an ethical gospel and theology. Nowhere in all the letters of Paul does this come through more clearly than it does here. Paul sets out for us how the message of the gospel is a transforming power that enables us to make changes that are necessary in our lives, to put away that which separates us from God and estranges us from other people, so that through the power of God's Spirit, we might be transformed. From Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, St. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministry. The teacher in teaching. The encourager in encouraging. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. This is our second lesson. A curious anomaly exists when we look at this morning's Gospel lesson from Matthew 16. Caesarea Philippi is a city that lives in the foothills of Mount Lebanon, some 2,000 feet above sea level. This location has a number of historical significances. It has religious, geographical, and political aspects. It's an ancient holy place where once stood a temple to the god Pan. It was one of those sources of the Jordan River which fed its waters 25 turbulent miles southward into the Sea of Galilee, which was actually a lake, some 700 feet below sea level. Herod Philip, a contemporary of Jesus, and a petty king of Trachonitis and other provinces east of Jordan built his summer residence there after his father Herod's death in 4 BCE. Jesus would have been well aware of all this. And we have to wonder, did he lead his disciples to this site 
because he wanted them to recognize him in a setting outside of their native Galilee? Did he want him to see them as Messiah for the entire world and not just the Jews? Jesus is seeking feedback from his disciples. What are folks saying about him? What do the articles on the front page of the Inquirer say about him? Who do they think he is? And he gets responses from the disciples that perhaps they think he is John the Baptist or Elijah the prophet who was foretold to come back to earth in advance of the Messiah or perhaps one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asks what I consider to be the most significant question of all time. Who do you say that I am? For how you answer that question determines the entirety of your lives. Peter boldly speaks for all the disciples and says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus blesses him for that proclamation and changes his name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. And then he pronounces that upon this rock he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against it. Now it's interesting how that phrase, that verse, has evolved over the centuries. The Roman Catholic Church points to Peter as the man who proclaimed that statement and considers that Jesus' response, upon this rock I will build my church, to be directed specifically to Peter. And so it is, the concept of apostleship continues, and that Peter himself is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the power to forgive and retain sin. And as such, he becomes the first pope. Protestants, on the other hand, focus on the declaration itself and the faithfulness which prompted it, so that Jesus is saying, upon this statement and belief of who I am, I will build my church. And so it is that all of us are given the power to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to announce forgiveness to the repentant and judgment to the unrepentant. This is the gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 